Good morning, good afternoon. I mean, it's two minutes past noon, so it's afternoon. Hi. Welcome to this session on agility and quality. Um, that's what I usually look like when I go out uh, to a customer to help them. So hi, my name is Sebastian. Um, when I'm not wearing a suit, which means I'm not working at a customer trying to help them build better PHP software, I'm working most of the time on PHP unit, which I've been doing for almost 10 years now. Um, at some point, I regularly, from time to time, still contribute to PHP a bit, be it in testing PHP before releases are made, or coming up with crazy ideas, like I really need this feature and this is why, um, or just doing some odd bug fixing here and there. There are some functionality in PHP that I'm not really, really proud of, but it's there because it was needed um, to test some really legacy um, PHP projects. And as of a couple of months ago, I'm also an Apache committer and a member of the Apache Software Foundation because one of my open source projects where I contributed for a couple of years to moved under the umbrella of the Apache Software Foundation. That's the Zeta components. They used to be known as the Easy components. Um, still the same software, still the great software quality that it was before, still the great documentation, everything, just now under the umbrella of the Apache Software Foundation. It's the first major PHP project um, that is now an official Apache project. It's still in incubation there, um, which means that we don't have any release yet. This is hopefully going to change soon. Um, yeah, and I'm also something what some people call uh, practitioners of academic computing. Yes, I'm a member of ACM and IEEE, so I can, when I see something interesting, read really expensive, expensive articles for a slightly reduced price because I'm a member. Um, I still don't really grasp this whole concept of academic publishing that you have to pay really enormous amounts of money to read something that is interested and, and valuable to everyone and should be free, but that's how it goes. So, yes, so this presentation is about agility and quality, two aspects that you really want to have um, in modern software development. And to start off with, to break the, kind of break the ice, um, I'm going to tell you a story. Well, something happened at the Google Test Automation Conference uh, last year in October in Hyderabad, India, where I met this guy from Greece who works for a German company in Switzerland on a big software project. And his name was Vasilis, and over dinner we realized that we have some similar interests. So not only are we really interested in testing software, building software, continuous integration and team management and stuff like that. Everything trying to make a software development team more efficient at producing great quality of software. But we also share a, a common pastime. So while I was still in high school, I did a lot of um, pen and paper role playing games, which came out um, in 1974. Dungeons and Dragons in the US became really, really popular. It took some six, eight years to, for, the, for this concept, uh, concept uh, to come over the ocean and to Germany under the name of uh, the Dark Eye. I think it's, uh, it's the English version of the Schwarze Auge. So that's what we played in high school. And then 30 years later, we now have um, modern computers and the internet so we can play similar games uh, online, like for instance World of Warcraft which I recently started playing. So if you have never seen World of Warcraft, this is not what it looks like out of the box. This is, um, it looks like a user interface fail, and that is because I'm using some add-ons that are not, well, they should not probably, be some of them should probably be turned off for this particular raid instance, because everyone is standing in the same place. So all of this ambient information that is in there appears in the same place. Um, but yeah, we managed. Um, so I had this discussion with Vasilis over dinner about, and it, 
in, a, in, in the beginning, it was half jokingly um, over, over dinner that we were talking. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, similarities between a team of players uh, in an online role playing game, such as the one that we play, and software development teams. There are different roles um, that different people have to fulfill for the whole team, for the whole project to be successful. And Blizzard, the creators of World of Warcraft, did an amazing job in, dist in, uh, in distilling these different roles that you have in pen and paper role playing, where you can basi basically do whatever you want. Yes, there are some certain constraints, but the game master in the end can say, yes, this is what you're allowed to do, and this is your job, and whatever. And they really distilled it down, dumped it down into three basic roles, and you it's kind of surprising to some extent that you find the same types of roles in a software project. So for instance, a typical adventuring party consists of five players for a really small uh, instance dungeon. Um, and you have one tank, one healer, and three so-called damage dealers. And it gets really, really, really hard to survive an accomplished goal um, if you mess up with these roles. If you say, okay, I don't take a healer, um, to the dungeon, yes, then you're probably going to die. Uh, and that's not what you want. And it's very similar in software projects. So while we were talking, is we, met, we f uh, figured out, yes, there's lots of um, similarities between the two. Um, so we distilled it down a bit. So after GTAG, Vasilis wrote a blog posting where he goes into much more detail. But the gist of it uh, is the following. So you need a tank, right? The tank's job in, the, in World of Warcraft is to keep um, the so-called aggro, um, which means keeping the monsters busy. So they attack him and not the healer and not the damage dealer so they can do their job. And in software projects, your project manager is your tank. He protects your developers from the customer, from the client. They make sure uh, that project, well, the software developers can actually do their job and accomplish the task. And if the project manager loses aggro, if the customer has the opportunity to directly tell the software developers what he or she thinks they should be doing, then you wipe, which means everybody dies and is not happy and has to start over. And that is not what you want. And of course, you need a healer. Uh, healers are awesome, they keep you alive. And your operations engineers are your healers. When your operations team gets the aggro, um, when, for instance, flaky infrastructure makes it hard or impossible for your software developers to do your job, um, then you wipe. When you have bad communication between your operations people and your software developers, then you wipe. It's amazing how many companies I, as a consultant, come into where there is still a situation where the operations people don't like to talk to software developers. So it's basically two completely separate teams. The software developers develop the software and at some point hand it off to operations and then operations hopefully does their job and deploys the application and runs it and operates it smoothly. That doesn't work, however, when the software developers never get a chance during development to run this on, uh, under um, live uh, circumstances. So sometimes the application just does not perform. And then in some silly settings, it's the operations uh, people's job to improve the performance, which is not really their job, because they should just install it and have um, everything else under control. So there's a lot of movement uh, going on in, so, uh, in the agile software development, especially in the web environment, um, where you're trying to get more cooperation between those two teams. And we'll come back to that uh, at, towards the end of the presentation under the name of DevOps. So to quickly sum up this analogy to World of Warcraft, your software developers are your damage dealers. The coders and testers, they build the software, they test the software, and they, well, get the job done, basically. So if the developers are working on multiple tasks, um, on multiple targets, 
when they're spread out uh, to attack many multiple enemies, then sooner or later the tank cannot protect them anymore and again, you wipe. And this is not a happy place to be in, you don't want that. So yes, you may be wondering if I'm actually starting to talk about something useful at some point. Hopefully I am now. Because when things go wrong in a software project, when your development team wipes, uh, the team has to work overtime and cancel vacations. And more often than not, office accidents like this one happen. Um, you don't want that. Uh, and more often than not, deadlines and quality goals are missed nevertheless. And there's an interesting article um, that gives this whole problem a name, which is useful to have, so then you can actually discuss about it and refer to it by name. And it's the time, money, quality, pick two fallacy. So the proposition there is, as a project manager, you basically have only three valves that you can tweak uh, in your project. You have the time, you have the money, and you have the quality. And you can say, okay, I don't care about the deadline. I want to deliver high quality, and I only have this many developers, so if I cannot get this done by the original deadline, I have to postpone the deadline. Or, okay, I cannot skip the deadline, um, and I also don't want to cut down on quality, so maybe I can invest a little bit more money, increase the budget, and put another developer on the problem. Which not always works, because just putting more manpower onto a problem doesn't necessarily make it go faster. Um, there is this Chinese proverb that nine women cannot deliver a baby in one month. So only to some degree can you uh, increase the project speed uh, by putting more money on it. And more often than not, um, the project manager decides uh, to cut down on quality. And the project manager is kind of special in a way because he's the only one who can turn all three of these valves. He can say, okay, I increase the time, I increase the budget, or I reduce quality. But for the developers that really like to ha deliver high quality, it they can only react to what the project manager says, which means they can only be told to reduce the quality, which is not um, nice. So in many aspects of life, we have learned from experience that quality can be traded off for cost. Right? Shall I go uh, to Zurich and buy the best chocolate that I know at Springli? Or should I just go to the supermarket around the corner and buy something cheap that does not taste as nice? Um, if I don't have the time or I don't have the money to go to Zurich and buy my favorite chocolate, and if I can live with something else, then that is probably nice. If I cannot af afford the Ferrari and, and I really want one, or, well, not that I'm, I don't even have a driver's license, so I don't really get that example. I more likely uh, understand the, the chocolate one. But anyway, as a result, we are used to the idea that quality costs more. And um, we'll come back later um, to that idea. Anyway, so finally, let's talk a little bit about Agile. I'm not going into too much detail about um, Scrum and Agile processes per, uh, per se. That is more like uh, the domain of uh, Torsten Rinne's presentation right in this room right after lunch. So Scrum is a very popular agile method for project management. Um, you have, for instance, the product backlog that keeps a high-level list that is maintained uh, throughout the entire project. This is where um, all the feature requests go into. And then for each sprint, which usually is a week or two, um, we take items from the product backlog and put it into the sprint backlog, which is then owned by the team, and the team prioritizes the items in there. And they're also rep uh, responsible for estimating how long it will take, whereas um, the product owner is responsible for prioritizing the items in the backlog by business value. And this is a really nice management process. But it is not an agile method for software engineering. There's, um, there are plenty of um, full stack agile um, software development frameworks out there, like Extreme Programming that tells you here uh, is a list of five, six things uh, that you should do and then you are doing Extreme Programming. There are other um, development pr uh, practices, but it all comes down to 
um, a couple of really common elements of agile software development and each team has to pick and choose from this catalog of best practices of agile software development what uh, works for them. So for instance, a lot of people have problems um, with extreme programming which demands pair programming. Um, and over the last five or six years since I've been doing um, consulting with regard to quality assurance in PHP projects for instance, I have never seen a company that really does pair programming all the time. What I see instead is that for some tricky algorithm or from, for some serious bug fixing that involves debugging, you do temporary pair programming to spread the knowledge and that seems to work out for most people. So what are those really common elements of agile software development? With regard to coding, you have collective code ownership, which means anyone can modify any code at any time, which requires that the team agrees upon a common coding standard so that um, everyone actually can read every other's code. The original authorship of the code is immaterial. So if you see something that um, looks broken or impedes the current development that you want to do, then you're allowed to change it. And since we have unit tests, and, or ideally test-driven development, we have an abundant uh, suite of automated tests, which creates confidence. So you make a change, you run the test, they tell you everything is fine. And even if that is not enough, uh, we still have version control, which, which provides some sort of insurance. So if you break something, you can always go back um, to the, the state that it was before. And then you can go one step further and use continuous integration and continuous inspection and have all of this automated in such a way that every time you change the code, some computer somewhere on, on your network checks out the latest state of the code, runs all the tools that we are about to see, runs the tests and reports, yes, everything is fine, no, you broke something. And this ensures that the system is always uh, in working order. And, since we're, and if you're doing test-driven development, you know that the system has a high quality because the programmers use test-driven development and continually improve the design of the application and improve the code uh, through refactoring. Okay, then it comes to testing, and all code must have unit tests, all, co all code must pass all unit tests before release, and when a bug is found, you write more tests. And as I mentioned earlier, this set of agile practices now extends from software development into uh, operations and maintenance. And so operations, in operations, what we see more and more is continuous deployment and continuous delivery. So that you don't have a handoff from the software development team to some operations people that then may or may not approve to install the new version of the software. Instead, you make a change to the software um, it's automatic, the change is automatically picked up by the continuous integration server. Continuous integration server says, yes, it's, it works fine. Then it makes a test deployment um, to a production-like environment, runs the Selenium tests against that. And then says, okay, it also works there, so I just push it live. All of these agile development processes put a high focus on software quality. And software quality means different things to different people. Um, the classic definition of software quality is what is now referred to, nowadays referred to as external quality. This is what a user can understand because he or she can see it, feel it, touch it, whatever. And it's also what uh, management usually understands. And this deals with functionality, usability, reliability, performance, supportability, and so on. It's basically what you can see as far as you can see something uh, with regard to software. Does the application work? Yes. Is it fast enough? Yes. Awesome. We can deploy it. We have a great product. Um, your engineers, however, may disagree with that because they are not really interested in external quality. They are interested in internal quality aspects. So for instance, they really like working code that is unique and not duplicated, that is simple and not complicated, clear and not confusing, puzzling, and more importantly, 
easy to adapt, easy to extend, easy to, uh, to test. And if you look at some really popular common PHP off-the-shelf applications, most of them have really, really good external quality. Their website looks nice, the product looks nice, it's really easy to install, it's really easy to get going. Um, but then at some point you need to adapt or extend the software and then you look at the code and see that the internal, internal quality is lacking and it gets really expensive really quickly to make the modifications that you want to make. And no, I'm not going to name names here. Sorry about that. So um, let's focus the test driven development for a bit which is a disciplined software development practice that focuses on software design. It's often misunderstood as, ju as just as a practice for writing tests. Yes, you can think of it like that, but then you are sort of missing a point. It's about driving the development, driving the coding process by first writing the automated tests and thinking about what do I want the API for this code that I'm about to write uh, look like, how is it um, intuitive for everyone that wants to reuse the code at some point in the future. And then you write the production code and you run the test and the test will tell you, yes, you're done, that this matches your specification that you wrote before. And you do that in short, frequent iterations. And there are plenty of studies out there, um, both <coughs> traditional studies in the academic sense, meaning uh, ACM or IEEE publications or just blog postings by companies that share their experience of how they develop code. And all of them agree, or most of them agree, um, that if you follow this practice, you get code that has fewer defects because if you make mistakes, you notice them really early on and they don't propagate through your system. And if you made them, um, you discover them Many, within minutes after writing the code, so unless you have a really bad short-term memory, um, you know what you did five minutes ago, you can go into the code, you don't need a debugger, you don't need to read through a lot of code because you know exactly what you did five minutes ago and just fix it. You also tend to write code that has fewer statements, that does ac accomplishes the goal with less fluff, boilerplate code, whatever you want to call it, uh, you also write code that is easier to understand from a logical complexity point of view. There's a lot of um, software metrics like the cyclomatic complexity or the end pass complexity that try to assign a value to how hard a piece of code is to understand uh, by aesthetically analyzing it. And lower computational complexity also means that you need less tests to fully test it. And it also means that a human being that wants to understand what the code does needs less time uh, to figure out what the code is actually doing. Also leads to lower coupling between classes, between parts of the source code, um, which is really great when you want to extend or change the system. So you need to touch less code or ideally only need to touch code in one place if you want to make one change and not touch everything. Um, which would be then the so-called Mikado architecture. Then you don't want to touch a single piece because then everything else uh, falls apart, especially when you don't have tests in a legacy application. And naturally, since we write the tests first, uh, we get a higher test coverage and volume. And of course, as far as uh, code functionality is concerned, we do this uh, using unit tests which tests a unit of code isolated from its dependencies, and this is really important. If I just want to test one function or one method, ideally I should only need one object and just call this one method that I want uh, to test. And if that method has dependencies, I test it as isolated as possible from all of its dependencies. This makes a test much more valuable because when it fails, I know exactly where the root cause for that failure can be, it can only be in the functional method that I just wanted to test and not be in some other code that is called by some other code that is called by what I want to test. A good unit test um, has a really descriptive name and thusly can be read as an executable specification for what the software piece, software fragment is supposed to do. 
um, they are automatically evaluated and repeatable. Just because I rerun the test, it should not give me a different result. Um, need only a really, really simple uh, test environment, ideally just the one object that I mentioned before. Uh, and for instance, not touch the database, not touch the file system, not talk to a web service, then it would not be a unit test. And yes, you can write such tests using a unit testing framework uh, such as PHP unit. And yes, such tests are valuable, but they're not called unit tests, they are integration tests. And because you have a really simple test environment, those tests tend to be really, really fast. So for instance, um, one of our customers has a test suite um, with about 50 or 60,000 unit tests, and it still runs in less than one and a half minutes or so. So running all of them gives you immediate feedback, um, and one minute, one and a half minute is still something that you can actually wait for. Yes, and unit tests are written with the code, not after the code. Um, this is kind of a more lax interpretation of what test-driven development means. Some people just <coughs> cannot think like test, cannot think in a test-driven way, or don't want to work like that, or, as in my case, uh, cannot work like that. Uh, I made the experience over the years that I cannot use test-driven development to develop PHP unit because I cannot write a test that uses a new feature of PHP unit that is not there yet, uh, so that's a chicken and egg problem. I know it's a highly specific problem, but um, I have problems as well. So, but what I do is that as soon as I figure out, okay, yes, th this code works, and um, it works the way that I want it to work, and I'm happy with the API, then I write the test right afterward. And this is less than an hour after I wrote the code. Um, so the memory is still fresh, and I write good unit tests, hopefully. And yes, you keep these tests as regression tests. You keep them for the future. They are an investment into the future. They allow you to verify at some point in the future that a change that you just made did not break anything. It has worked fine for the last year, which is always nice to have. Uh, if you have never seen uh, unit tests with PHP unit, this is what it looks like. Um, PHP unit doesn't really care what you name your test classes or your test methods. There are a couple of really useful conventions to follow. So for instance, the tests for something that is called a bank account go into the bank account test class. And then you have public methods that are prefixes test. Um, if you don't like the prefix test, you can leave it out and annotate the method that it is a test. Uh, and then you give a descriptive name, like for instance, the balance is initially zero and then you use the full power of the PHP programming language to express what you want to do. So first, you set up your environment, the so-called fixture, uh, in this case, create the bank account object, call the get balance method on the bank account object, and then use the so-called assertion to assert that um, the actual value returned by the balance, get balance method, matches the expected value of zero in this case. And then you can go to the command line and say PHP unit bank account test and it will run the test for each test that is run. It will print a single character of progress output when everything is fine, you, you get a dot. And then just some summary information in the end. There's this uh, assumption that all tests should pass all the time. And only when that is not the case, PHP unit will, like any other X unit testing framework, will become more uh, talkative and give you more information as you need it. So yes, just some summary information. And I mentioned earlier that these unit tests can be read as an executable specification of what the software is supposed to do. PHP unit supports that idea by uh, the test docs uh, result printer. So you just say dash dash test docs and it reads back this specification for you and we'll get the information here. Yes, this is related to something that is called a bank account, and the balance is initially zero, and we get a check mark. 10 minutes? Okay, fair enough. Yep, okay. Yes, just a little bit of confusion. That's fine. Um, so that's with regard to uh, testing, unit testing of PHP applications. Um, quality assurance of PHP projects has 
uh, gained quite some interest over the last couple of years, so more and more uh, tools for so-called static analysis of PHP code uh, have uh, come up to look at your code, and I'm going over some of these tools really, really briefly. Um, so one thing that is sometimes useful is to know how much code do I have. There's a tool called PHP LOC that gives you a really bird's eye view. How much code do I have? How is it structured? Um, it's my number one tool that I start when I do a, a code review for a customer to get an idea. Am I dealing with a PHP 4 code base, PHP 5 code base, PHP 5.3 code base? Um, am I going to have problems with regard to testing um, because all methods are static and untestable and so on? There's another tool called PHP Depend, which gives you this really nice software overview, overview pyramid, among many other things. Um, yep, then there are tools that tell you how the code is executed. So for instance, um, if you look at this piece of code, which is the set balance method um, from the bank account class, we can look at how PHP sees it, and this is bytecode, and can also get a visual representation of that. And sometimes during a code review, this is valuable to see, okay, how is the control flow going on? Am I checking all of these paths? And so on. And there are tools that look for where something is broken in the source code, like PHP code sniffer, for instance. And this looks really, really boring because I'm not violating my own coding standard uh, for this simple example project. So I'm switching over to something where I actually find uh, violations in this example. This is uh, type of three. So you get a highlight overview of uh, how often which rule um, was violated. So for instance, here the high score is 10, uh, uh, 1055 violations of the rule that you should not use the error suppression operator or the shut up operator. Um, and you don't really want to have it in your code. And then you can have a look at where this actually happens. And I'm sure that Thorsten will go over some of these tools uh, in his presentation after lunch again. There's another tool called PHPMD, PHP Mess Detector, um, that does more detailed analysis of the source code than PHP Code Sniffer can. And this will tell you about unused code, for instance, or code that is too complex, too error prone, um, and so on. There's another tool called PHP CPD, the copy paste detector, that does exactly what the name suggests. It looks for duplicate code. Um, you don't really want to have that. So this is actually quite good, less than 1% out of uh, almost 400,000 lines of code. The high score that I've seen was 18% out of a 7 million line PHP project. Um, yeah, just imagine 17 or 18 percent out of seven million lines of code. How much code you can just delete if you eliminate all uh, the duplicate code? There's plenty new tools uh, that keep coming up. Um, all of, most of these tools have something in common in that they generate XML log files that follow established standards from the Java world. So, for instance, PHP Unit can write JUnit XML and Clover XML for code coverage. PHP code sniffer writes checksal XML, PHP MD writes PMD XML, and so on, which means we can reuse a lot of really interesting and cool software from the Java world to analyze these log files, to do something useful with these log files. Um, and there's this website, phpqatools.org, that Manuel Pichler and I started over a year ago. And by started, I mean we registered the domain and made a redirect to a small site that's basically just a placeholder where we list what kind of tools we know about and what they are used for. I really hope that at some point we actually get the time to put something even more useful there. But so far, that is a really good uh, starting point if you're interested in figuring out what kind of tools are there and where you can get them. And then you can go one step further and Look at continuous integration, which is about feeling the pulse of a project, running all these tools every time you change the code, keep the information over time, visualize it in a good way. And this provides insight into the development process and the code quality throughout the life cycle of the project by automatically fetching new revisions from the version control system, running the tests, analyzing the code, and collecting and reporting these software metrics. 
So in case you're wondering um, what the best way of doing continuous integration for PHP projects is, um, and of course this is my opinion, my advice, um, best solution right now is use Jenkins. Yes, it's written in Java, it doesn't bite, it does its jo job really, really well, huge open source community behind it. Um, there's a tool or there's a new project that has recently started um, together with some other people that are using Jenkins in PHP projects called Jenkins PHP, which gives you a template for Jenkins jobs for PHP projects, um, which cuts down the time to set up a Jenkins CI server for PHP projects from about an hour to five minutes. And then those five minutes were even too long for me uh, and I created the next project, which is the PHP project wizard where you just go into your source code directory and say, PPW, this is my source code directory, this is my test directory, this is the coding center that I want to use. And then it just generates the configuration files for you. And now we're down from about one hour to less than one minute. And that's really cool. There are other options like cruise control, like PHP under control, which is built on cruise control. PHP under control is really nice but it's still built on cruise control, and cruise control is one of the, well, I'm trying to come up with a nice word for it, but uh, it's not one of the best pieces of software that I've come across with from an operations point of view. It crashes a lot, and when it crashes, it eats your data, and that is not nice, and you don't really want uh, to use that. There's Bamboo and TeamCity, which are commercial alternatives. Both of them work with PHP projects. Um, I've never personally worked with TeamCity. I've quite some experience with Bamboo. And all the customers that uh, I came across that were using Bamboo or wanted to use Bamboo have now been convinced otherwise and have been migrated to Jenkins because Bamboo also has issues. Uh, and then there's Arbit, which is a uh, continuous integration server and issue tracker and source code browser and project management tool written in PHP. Um, it's, well, basically in alpha at the moment and has been so for over a year. So I know the people working on it uh, have lots of respect for them. Just I don't see the need or the point of re-implementing something that we already have, um, and Jenkins works really, really well. Um, yes, avoid Big Bang deployments. Um, there's a trend to going faster with release cycles, and our highest priority should be to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And if you look at how really big websites are doing it, so for instance, if you go to code.flickr.com, you'll see something like Flickr was last deployed six hours ago, including five changes by three people. In the last week, there were 74 deploys of 447 changes by 22 people. And then um, one of our customers, uh, they usually make somewhere between 40 and 60 deploys a day. Um, and every engineer at Etsy writes automated tests on a daily basis and our Hudson, which is now also a Jenkins, uh, continuous integration server runs about 2,500 tests with every commit um, around 20 times a day. That means running around 250,000 PHP unit tests uh, in a typical work week. That's awesome. Um, there's a lot of design patterns coming up to deal with this kind of change. If you have this high deployment uh, frequency, um, with regard to continuous integration, you can basically follow two paths. You can, on the one hand, say, okay, for every new branch in my Git repository that is created, I want to automatically have a job in Jenkins, and that is possible because it's highly scriptable. Or you do something like latent code patterns, where you all do all your work in, in one branch and just have so-called feature flags, feature bits, um, whatever. There are, well, there's no common name for it yet. Different teams call it different things, but it's all the same. You have switches in your code that say, okay, if I'm in this environment, I do that, and 
then you all do, do all your testing uh, off of one branch, which allows you also in production to turn these features on and off. For instance, if you want to do experiment, experiment driven development, like you want to say, I want to figure out whether I get the higher conversion rate if I make my buy button uh, red instead of green and just roll it out to 1% of your users, that's fine. That's possible with these feature flags. Or you can also say, okay, I have this one feature that is really um, requires, or has performance issues, and if my, my site is under high load, I just turn it all off. Also possible with these uh, feature flags. This is an example of what that looks like um, at Flickr. Um, this is from somewhere else. I think this is from Forst. Not really that much interesting. Um, what's interesting, however, is that a lot of these companies that are um, really early adopters of this continuous delivery, continuous um, deployment process are blogging very actively about it and share their experience, what works for them, what did not work for them. Uh, so it's really interesting to read that and pick the, uh, the bits and, uh, choose the bits and pieces that may or may not work for you and just try it out. There are no silver bullets, at least not yet, so you need to see um, what can work for you and what doesn't. And of course, you can take this one step further and say, okay, we use this for dark launching, and this is something that Facebook and Twitter have been uh, known to do. So they have a new feature. Um, they don't deploy it to all the users. They just deploy it to 1%, then 2%, then 5%. Oh, we have a performance issue. You go back down to 1%, still continue to gather performance metrics, um, go through another inter iteration of optimization, and then start again and increase it from 1% to 2% to 5%, and at some point roll it out to all 500 million users. And again, Facebook is very active uh, in blogging about that. This is, for instance, a starting point, uh, and I put the slides online so you get all the URLs and you can just click on there and do some further reading. And there's a nuclear option that you get when you have um, these feature flags in your code base. And this is something that both Facebook and Twitter also do. So for instance, if there's really high load on the site, Facebook may or may not uh, turn off the chat. Or Twitter may or may not turn off so, uh, certain features. So you degrade gracefully. You don't turn off the whole site. You just turn off the features that have a really high performance impact and they're not, that are not necessary for the main functionality. And this all relates to the emerging, emerging understanding of the interdependence of development and operations in meeting a business goal uh, of producing timely software products and services and someone came up with the name DevOps for that, which yeah, is just a good Good word for a uh, good word for yeah that all of these should play nice together. Uh, none of them can survive on their own. It's like in our World of Warcraft raiding party. You need the tank, you need the healer, you need the damage dealers. None of them can accomplish uh, the big task by themselves. And one final thing: Why are we doing this again? Well, we want to uh, be able to change our application. Um, as fast as needed to meet our business requirements. And in such a way that the cost of a change does not exceed the business value of the change. So if my software is of a really low internal quality, over time it becomes more and more, e more expensive to e make even the tiniest change. So it's a really good investment into the future to maybe be a little bit slower in the beginning on the project and write good software, come up, up uh, with a clean architecture, write clean code, and see, think of this as an investment into the future, that in, in the future you can, at a sustainable rate, add new value to the software without sacrificing quality or in the, or, yeah, and quality is also related um, to security. So you don't sacrifice security, for instance, or performance or any, anything else um, over time. And there's a really good blog posting or blicky posting, as he calls it, Martin Fowler, uh, that came out last week about the tradable quality hypothesis. Um, 
you cannot save on internal quality. It will cost you more in the end if you want to try, it out, try to cut costs on internal quality because you do not gain in other dim dimensions such as uh, cost, scope, or speed. Instead, you need to realize that internal quality is not an impediment to speed, uh, but a, uh, an enabler of speed. So if you have good internal quality, you can move faster, you can make changes quicker, and reducing internal quality can only slow us down. Thank you. I don't get to point. Sorry. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, I wondered how you managed to do a, a talk with, with World of Warcraft and Jenkins and didn't manage to mention Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's uh, kind of an insider joke quest kind of question. Yes, it eluded me may or may not be related to the fact that I did not have, uh, that, that I don't have the achievement yet, so. Yes, any other serious question? <laughs> Hi, um, you were talking about how internal quality is very important to you, and I work for a company and we do XP, and we do, all of our production code is written in pairs. And for, for me, it seems that it's more like a, code review would have been the old way to ensure quality, and internal quality in particular. Yes. And pair programming, for, 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 as, as I see it, provides a sort of a continuous code review, which, which when you do need to bring it to a larger audience, as it were, more people to get involved, we, we do do that as well. But it seems to me that it's, it's the bean counters that are preventing pair programming from happening, not the developers. And if internal yes. development well, is what's important. It can, I've seen it both ways. I've seen teams where, as you refer to them, the bean counters, that um, we, we heard about this uh, extreme programming thing and um, pair programming and whatever, because they think of this, of course, uh, in uh, cost value, cost benefit. And if you explain it to them in these terms that they understand, they see the value of it. They see that it um, furthers the spreading of knowledge and that you're fail safe when somebody leaves the company or if somebody is sick or on vacation or whatever, that somebody else, at least one other developer has the same knowledge. They understand that, or some of them do. But then you have developers that don't want to work with somebody from nine to five, sit next to them and communicate uh, uh, a long time. And some developers just don't want to do that. Fair enough. That's fair. It's, and, it's but mo of course, more commonly, I've, I've been to, develop, uh, to companies where the developers say, yes, we would really like to do pair programming, but the bean counters uh, don't want us to do that because they say, okay, I need, I'm paying two developers to do the job of one. Yes, I save on the cost for a, mach uh, a computer for the second guy, but that is just one time cost efficiency reduction thingy, but over time um, it's more expensive because I'm paying two developers to do the job of one. Yeah, but we find, I think we find that, that two people together actually do get more done than one and higher quality. And yes. there's no, that you can't hide stuff under the, t under the carpet, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And co collective code ownership is another thing we swap around a lot, so you really don't feel like you own any one piece of code and you also feel that you can contribute yeah. to all the code. And that's the way we do it. I agree. <laughs> Any other? Um, regarding the uh, continuous um, delivery, continuous deployment, and then quality, from your experience, or maybe you have any kind of a data or statistics, how does it actually affect the quality? Because if we've seen all those buckets, all those ifs, else, how does it affect the code quality, and then, for example, the code metrics, and then when you do the continuous integration and inspection, how does it actually affect that? Um, that was not really just a single question, it was multiple questions in one. I'm trying to come up with a way of answering all aspects of that. Please, so please remind me if I get one of them. So yes, uh, it depends on how 
um, you do um, your version control, for instance. As I mentioned, for instance, at the moment we have one customer um, where they said, okay, we do not want to have these feature flags. Instead, we want to work on each new feature in a separate branch of, of the, the main development branch and automatically for each new branch have uh, a new job created in Jenkins and then when the branch at some point goes away because it is merged into the integration branch then the job in Jenkins is deactivated, not deleted but deactivated so you have to keep the data and can review it uh, and then at some point delete it because uh, you don't need it anymore. And use that approach and, and um, in, the, in such a setup those feature branches only get merged into the integration branch, not into the master branch. Only Jenkins is allowed to merge from the integration branch into the master branch. So you know that you can have in the master branch only code that was verified by the continuous integration tool and then you, for instance you can do deployments off of that master branch. Um, yes, the feature Feature flags add complexity to the code, so that has a negative effect on, uh, on the cyclometric complexity or n pass complexity metric, for instance, because you have multiple choices of whether or not the feature is currently active. Um, and then it basically comes down to whether or not these feature flags are temporary or if you want to keep them over time. So for instance, we have customers where they don't keep any or only really one or two of these feature flags in production, but use them um, for, for dark launching, for instance. So they keep them in the code as long as the feature has not been deployed to 100% of the user base. At that point, when they decide, okay, this goes now out to all users, then the feature flag is removed. And then this uh, penalty to the complexity metrics is gone. But it's like always, it's, it's a trade-off that you have to make and these tools provide um, the possibility to ignore a certain rule for a certain code block. So that is something that you could look into. Um, yeah, but you need, you need to figure out what you want to do, what your workflow should be, how you want to handle this, and then pick and choose the right practices and tools um, to accomplish your goal. There's one more over here, uh, two. Oh, oh, sorry. I didn't see you, I only saw him. Hi, uh, do you know of any uh, tools that uh, can do acceptance testing, automated acceptance testing on Ajax sites, like Selenium can do PHP unit for more basic sites? Um, so my answer would be Selenium. Can that do the Ajax driven sites? That also works with Ajax sites, yes. Okay. I gave quite some That's a good answer for me. Yep. More questions? Fight. It's, it's much less of a question, more of a comment about the, the adding complexity when you add feature flags. In many cases, you can get around that increasing complexity if you use dependency injection and things like that, so that you don't yes. end up with if statements sitting inside your, your application code, but more to do with how you wire up your, your classes at, at, at the start. Yeah, uh, or configuration or whatever, yeah. Um, and then there was um, a question to the floor really about, uh, to get back to this pairing, I just wondered how, how many people here do pair every day at the moment? Because I kind of assumed it was much more common than it is, I think. Wow. <laughs> before we go for our lunch, lunch break. Yes, I don't want to stand between you and your lunch. That is, that is really, really bad for votes. <laughs> the speaker did not finish on time. I did not get my coffee. And yes, I've gotten such comments, yes. One more question. Um, I hear the mic. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Hello, I, I noticed in your list of continuous integration projects, bitten wasn't mentioned, and it's so bitten. Yes, because I have been bitten by bitten. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really that bad then? Um, I tried using it when it first um, came out like 
two, three years ago. And back then, it didn't work with PHP Unit. And then somebody, I, I opened the bug report. Um, it sat there being ignored for a really long time. Then somebody said, yes, I'm, I made a patch to Bitten, and now it works for PHP Unit and PHP projects. I tried the patch. It didn't work for me. And by that time, I didn't really care anymore. It's really nice. I think it can be really nice if you use track and want to have it just in one. So for those who don't, not, don't know, Bitten is uh, kind of an add-on for track, so you can do your continuous integration uh, as part of, of track. Um, <coughs> yes. But no personal experience with, with, without uh, yeah, going beyond just trying it and didn't get Nick to work. Okay, unfortunately, we don't, um, uh, we don't have time for any further questions because we don't want to deprive you from any uh, lunch break. So after all that food for thought, I'm sure you will work on time. Thank you very much, Mr. Beckham.